Hello and welcome to Talk the Walk. I'm Azam Khan. As Hong Kong sheds its pandemic restrictions and opens up to the Chinese mainland and the world, the city looks to re-engage with international partnerships and find new ways to be the cultural port between China and the world. Ireland was one country which was seen a substantial boost in bilateral relations with China until the pandemic, with trade increasing exponentially yearly and more frequent high-level government visits between both countries. My guest today is the founding director of the Irish Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong, a longtime entrepreneur and philanthropist in the city, and currently the chairman of the Multitude Foundation, a Hong Kong-based entity that supports local artists and cultural dialogue, Bill Condon. Mr. Condon, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Very pleased to be here this morning, Azam. Right now, the biggest focus is the reopening with the border with the Chinese mainland. So I wanted to ask you what that means, not just for Hong Kong's economy, but for the overall synergy with the Greater Bay Area in terms of flow with people and cultural exchange. Well, I think it's a very interesting question. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to um, the reopening, which is scheduled initially for the, for the 8th of January. Um, and I know it will be a gradual process, and it will be interesting to see how that process is managed, particularly in the light of escalating case numbers in Hong Kong and in parts of mainland China. And just to ensure that the, you know, that the government do monitor um, and ensure that the, the health services aren't put under undue and unnecessary pressure. But, you know, it's a very welcome um, to see the borders being opened again because for a variety of reasons um, Hong Kong has suffered dramatically economically um, and through the personal relationships of people not being able to to go back to to mainland China to visit family but uh, for the last decade China has been the lifeblood of Chinese um, people and businesses have been the lifeblood of, of Hong Kong so it's had a very severe impact on the economy. Uh, really important to see it opening up, opening up quickly. Um, and in terms of the Greater Bay Area, which I'm a, have been a supporter of from the outset, um, you know, when you consider the success of the Pearl River Delta, one can only assume that the Greater Bay into into Greater Bay Area will be the equivalent of that on steroids. There are issues which need to be addressed, and uh, really, in my mind, most of that is how does this integration occur in terms of legal systems, legal disputes, um, and areas like that. But the, the, you know, the overall concept, I think, is brilliant. I think perhaps it's not very well understood at grassroots level in Hong Kong, um, especially younger, among younger generations who perhaps don't really understand the opportunities that um, are literally across the border and will be in terms of careers, in terms of um, quality of life. Um, and I think you take that onto the broader international community. And whilst there's a lot of rhetoric, again, I think, you know, there's not really a clear understanding of, of what's happening and, and, and the scale of the opportunity as well. And, and that's where I think Hong Kong is a particularly important role to play in informing people and in keeping people informed and being that uh, as has been uh, mentioned on a number of occasions by President Xi and indeed John Lee and other government ministers you know there's a great opportunity here for Hong Kong to be that sort of um, that access point. How does Hong Kong play the balance between um, focusing on its synergy with the Greater Bay Area as well as the rest of the world especially when they're opening up um, almost at the same time the, with the border with the Chinese mainland as well as the rest of the world. So is there a balance there that it needs to straddle? Well, I suppose to some degree there is, but um, uh, if you like, the later, the greater Bay Area there, in terms of its administration and how it's going to, um, how, it's, how, how the, the various elements are going to be integrated are not quite figured out yet. So the priority to me, to some degree, is um, is focusing on re-engaging with the international community and bringing them into the dialogue and debate about the Greater Bay Area. Um, so they feel vested in it. And I think that's not the case at the moment, um, certainly in the international 
in international circles. And I think Hong Kong is there's a great opportunity for Hong Kong to do that, to engage at a level with um, uh, overseas corporates, with overseas governments, and get them vested in the dialogue and debate and the development of the greater Bay Area. Um, and I think that's really to everyone's advantage because uh, dialogue um, can overcome some of the hurdles that already exist. Um, and I think it would certainly benefit the overall Greater Bay Area project to have um, overseas uh, governments and companies vested in and, and clearly understanding it and clearly understanding the opportunities from, from, from their own perspectives. Right. Um, I'm curious to know, how much does Ireland actually um, understand and know about the Greater Bay Area currently from an investment standpoint? Um, because, like, for example, when Chief Executive John Lee was in the Middle East um, and he was able to foster a lot of different investment opportunities, et cetera, um, but he did mention that um, there, was a, there was still a lot of um, uh, gaps in the understanding of the Greater Bay Area by uh, invest investors there. I think probably Ireland is not dissimilar to, to many other um, uh, countries in terms of, you know, really with three years of COVID, China being closed off, much of many of our own Ireland, including being closed off. Um, you know, the, 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 the focus was on keeping the economies going and sort of continuing and forging relationships with China per se, as opposed to looking at the, at the opportunities in the Greater Bay Area. And even over the last um, couple of years, and over the last year, Huawei have made a big investment in, in Ireland. So that's, that China-Ireland dialogue continues. But from a personal perspective, I think a lot of people are talking about the Greater Bay Area, but, you know, really, they don't always understand the opportunities. So I think there's definitely um, an opportunity for Mr. Lee to, to consider a visit to Ireland. Um, the Irish economy is booming at the moment. Um, a figure I, I, I came across recently was, um, I'm just trying to find it here. Um, yeah, the Exchequer collected over 83 billion in, in, in taxes this year, which is a record. Wow. Um, bearing in mind the difficulties of COVID and everything else, and had, had a 5 billion um, euro uh, surplus. Uh, which is, and those bearing in mind, Ireland's quite a small country, but they're they're fairly significant figures in the climate um, uh, within the you know the economic turmoil, um, the 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 problems in Ukraine, COVID, um, and yet the Irish economy has has, has managed to keep going. With the whole Brexit and, and the whole figuring out of Brexit is all on top of that. Yeah. It's... Well, Brexit is probably one of the most difficult issues facing um, facing the Irish government. Um, it's complicated. It's got a long history. Um, I'm glad to say um, the tone seems to be improving between the British government and the Irish government. And during Boris Johnson, um, uh, rhetoric wasn't um, wasn't particularly uh, um, wasn't particularly good. Right. Um, and that tone is definitely changing. Um, I think all parties realise that the, the, the protocol is not perfect, um, but there was no roadmap to develop it. Everybody was trying to do their best under difficult circumstances, right. and nobody really expected to have to do it. From a personal perspective, I think, um, again, this is, this, is a, this is a very sensitive area that needs dialogue and debate. Right. And that dialogue, people have to be prepared to listen, have to be prepared to give ground in certain areas. And that goes to all sides, um, uh, the, the, the Irish government, the British government and the, and the EU. As someone who, you know, who's done a lot of work in the cultural exchange and um, also in fostering cultural exchange in Hong Kong, um, what are some ways for Hong Kong to better uh, improve in this as the city opens up now? Well, I think in terms of culture, I mean, it's obviously one of the, 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 the keys, or it was one of the key pillars um, President Xi uh, referred to in his, in, in, when, he, when he came here in July. And obviously, subsequently, John Lee has been promoting that as well. I think one of the difficulties in Hong Kong is that it's always been a market. Culture has played really very little, in, or has been given little, very little significance, which I find particularly sad. 
Um, and there is, whilst the dynamic and the rhetoric has changed dramatically since July and culture and heritage is, top, is on top and of everybody's agenda. I think there's often a lack of understanding. It's not simply about having a market here. Like, for example, in terms of art, Hong Kong was an art market. It wasn't a cultural place. It was, a, it was an art market. And um, for artists to survive here, it's, 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 it's extremely difficult. They don't, have, they don't have much support. They have very little exhibition space, um, living space, studio space, all really, really um, expensive. So it's a, a difficult place for them to be. And what I've been, I suppose, saying for quite a while is that the focus in order to have to create a genuine cultural hub in Hong Kong, we really need to focus on that grassroots level. The software, the, hard, the hardware is important. We've got M Plus, we've got Wuxi Theatre and uh, other things coming online. But at the end of the day, it's about the creativity that's being generated in Hong Kong. And there's a lot of talent here, a lot of talent in the Greater Bay Area, a lot of talent in China. And you're seeing individual cases um, as recently as uh, last month was announced, an announcement by the Hong Kong Philharmonic to do a metaverse symphony um, with a local composer. Now, it's, it's, it's projects like this that will help promote Chinese culture, Hong Kong culture to the world. And that, to me, is very important. Um, when you've got such a rich and diverse cultural heritage going back 5,000 5, years, but to be able to tell some of that story through contemporary, um, through contemporary means and using Hong Kong as, 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 as the vehicle, I think is brilliant. But at the end of the day, it's about supporting the creative talent um, as much as having the, um, the hardware there to do it. Right. I need to pause you right there while we step away for a quick break. Uh, don't go anywhere. We'll be back with Bill Condon after the break. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Talk the Walk. I'm speaking with Bill Condon, chairman of the Multitude Foundation and former director and the founding director of the Irish Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Mr. Condon, Jackie Chan went to an Irish religious school in Hong Kong, a uh, little less known fact for a lot of people. Um, I feel like that best encapsulates the impact of Ireland in Hong Kong, uh, both in uh, cultural exchange and uh, student exchange and education specifically. Would you say that's accurate? Well, Ireland has always been heavily involved in education in Hong Kong since um, uh, the Yin College was set up in 1919 by Peter Tu and passed over to the Jesuits in, I think, 1931 or 32. And there's a fair number of um, significant people in Hong Kong who've gone through the, the Jesuit education system, including our current chief executive, John Lee, some former chief executives and a, a number of government ministers. And Ireland has always been renowned for its education. It's one of its strengths um, in, in today's modern society. It's one of the pillars which um, enabled Ireland to um, garner the title of the Celtic Tiger in, in the 80s. It was really founded on that um, strong educational pillar. Um, and that, as I say, that educational pillar has been, played an important role in linking the two countries for you know almost uh, almost 100 years and um, it is very important it's there have over the years been an increase in the number of um student exchanges and um, we're seeing more students more irish students pre-covid um coming to hong kong um, and indeed going to um other parts of china to to study um, and learn mandarin for example so that educational pillar is a, is a, is a very significant one. And uh, where I see, I mean, I see interesting similarities between Ireland and Hong Kong, sometimes more in a cultural sense. And, you know, um, uh, I'm, so we're seeing more and more um, Hong Kong people for the last probably 15 years moving to Ireland as Ch Chinese companies have been setting up there. And an interesting, um, one interesting uh, statistic, not a statistic, but one interesting comment is our last Lord Mayor of Dublin was a woman of Hong Kong heritage. Her parents had moved there in the 70s. 
Oh. Now, to have a, a, a woman, first of all, and a Chinese woman as Lord Mayor, I think says a lot about Ireland and its openness. I think uh, education being uh, the primary source of the bilateral uh, connection is uh, wonderful, as good as it gets as a pillar um, between two, especially two distinct cultures. Um, and I believe also, correct me if I'm wrong, several years back, China awarded, um, they ranked Ireland as the number one uh, country to go do road trips. Um, I think this was four or five years back, they told, like, it, it came out with this rank in China um, for its people to go and visit and, and travel around. Well, I think, again, it was a very important accolade for Ireland to receive. Um, and I think Ireland is renowned for being a ver very welcoming country. But if I think back to, um, and I can't remember the precise date, but prior to President Xi Jinping taking power, his first overseas trip before he took power was to Ireland, um, which upset, I suppose, many other um, of the leading European countries wondering why um, the about-to-be president was visiting such a small country. And I think he understood that, apart from the um, uh, wonderful culture and similarities in terms of a, a very old history, our own language, um, but he understood the value of the uh, development in Ireland, particularly in areas like life sciences, agriculture. And these were all areas which he, could, he saw Ireland as potentially a model that he was interested in and could be replicated in parts of China, and also to really enhance that relationship. So that was really a starting point. And, you know, the award was just a, a, a wonderful accolade for Ireland to receive. And as I say, there have been many, many um, visitors uh, to, again, pre-COVID, and I'm sure it'll happen post-COVID, um, visitors to Ireland. Um, there's a, a, a significant Irish a Chinese community in, 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 in Ireland, in parts of Dublin. The um, Lunar New Year is, is a very big celebration in Dublin. Um, right. uh, yeah, so those, those ties... There's always a welcome, there's lots to do, there's lots to see. Um, and as I say, it's an increasing number of, um, of uh, Hong Kong people moving to work in, 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 in some of the Chinese companies in, in Ireland. Right. Uh, and Leo Varadkar um, resumed position of Taoiseach um, of Ireland. Uh, what are your expectations on uh, what his approach to China will be and if there's any difference um, from when he was first time prime minister? Well, I think the relationships have always been, uh, has always been strong, has always been steady. I don't see any reason for that to change. Um, you know, as I say, there are, there are increasing investments from Chinese companies in Ireland, the last one being Huawei, which was last year, which is a, a significant investment. Um, we'd like to see uh, more and more companies located in Ireland, coming across to the Greater Bay Area. And I think that's something that um, both sides should be looking at more closely. But in terms of um, some of the strategic areas like life sciences, um, where Ireland is very, very strong, uh, there's a, there's, there are a lot of opportunities for Chinese companies. Ireland is a wonderful place to set up, which is why so many um, multinationals have the European headquarters there. There's an attractive tax rate, but that's not really the reason. They get a lot of support from enterprise, from the, uh, the Irish Development Authority, who are there to support companies coming into the country to set to, to really to, to set them up, and um, and to make that setup as painless as possible. And one of the most most important things is they've got access to a, a highly skilled labour force, and that again goes back to the the high standard of education. And whilst a market of 7 million people in the Ireland of Ireland is not necessarily going to be that attractive to, to um, most Chinese companies. Obviously, the, 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 it's, a, it's a stepping stone into the EU, right. of course, the UK, and, and further afield. Yeah, Ireland uh, being one of the smaller populations in the EU, but it's the fourth largest exporter to China from the bloc. I feel like the Irish really, um, they, they cherish the, the trade and the educational aspect with with China. And the Irish Foreign Minister, Simon Coveney, um, stressed that he did not want to be uh, caught up in the frictions uh, which has been displayed between the US and China 
and, uh, and to a lesser extent with the EU bloc uh, and China. Um, so would you say that's just a reflection on how much they um, are resolve, how much their resolve is with its trade and cultural aspect with China? Well, I think as a, as a, as a country, we always believe in dialogue. Um, and I think that's one of the important things. There's no suggestion of, of, of rights or wrongs in any of this. Um, there's been a, a very long and productive history with China, um, dating back to when the first embassy was set up in, in Beijing in 1980. And I actually accompanied um, one of our, well, I accompanied Bertie Ahern, our former prime minister, on probably the first visit to mainland China in 1997 and had the privilege of meeting um, Premier Zhu Rongji and President Zhang Zemin at the time. Um, and I accompanied a number of other Irish prime ministers and, and presidents over the years. But the importance of the relationship has, has, has you know, has, has, has always been there. Um, and as I say, some, there certain, culturally there are significant differences, but Ireland as a small nation has always been inclined to embrace dialogue and listen um, and generate greater understanding. And that's very much the case, I think, with China. And as somebody who's been involved with China probably since the mid-90s as a, as a foreigner, I realize the more you know, sometimes the less you understand. Mm -hmm. So, um, but that's, that's the beauty of, of, of cultural differences. It's what, it's what makes us a, an interesting planet and an interesting place to be. Right. But, as, um, uh, yeah. As, as someone who has been involved in China since, you know, the, in the 90s, like you said, the founding director of the Irish Chamber of Commerce back then, how would you compare, just real quick, how would you compare the, the macro sense of um, between both regions um, from then to now and going forward? Well, it's, I suppose the staggering thing is this, 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 the speed and the scale of the development in China and, you know, bringing, you know, what, uh, the, the 1.2 billion people out of the poverty zone. Um, and a lot of people don't really understand, uh, don't understand the significance of that. There's still a lot of work to be done, but um, it's really the scale and the speed that is phenomenal. You just don't see that in Europe or in the West. Um, and it's what gives, um, to me, most Chinese cities, a level of vibrancy and excitement that's also difficult to match in the West. I believe that's all the time we have. Bill Condon, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you the same time next week. Goodbye.